So I'm going to try to use our time today to cover three things. First, I'm going to explain briefly the work of the Auschwitz Institute. Second, I'm going to briefly explain how the work of the Auschwitz Institute ties into exciting work going on at Binghamton University. And third, I'm going to spend most of my time explaining a specific program recently developed and implemented by the Auschwitz Institute involving police training here in the United States. Um, so the Auschwitz Institute is dedicated to training government officials in genocide and mass atrocity prevention. Um, and we've, we then help governments also design and implement targeted programs to address mass atrocity risk factors in their countries. Over the last decade, the Auschwitz Institute has trained over 6,000 government officials from over 90 nations. Our follow-on work to help governments design and implement prevention programs now reaches about 50 countries, including through regional networks in Latin and Central America, the Great Lakes region of East Africa, and the Balkans. Our guiding principle is that no genocide or mass atrocity outbreak is ever truly spontaneous or random. Rather, they are the culmination of processes that can date back decades or even centuries. And these processes provide warning signs of what may be coming. If we pay attention to those warning signs, we can take steps to interrupt, delay, or disable those dangerous processes and over time prevent genocide and mass atrocity outbreaks. Now the Binghamton connection relates to the nature of genocide. As you all know, genocide has been around since we started writing down history. It is not a simple problem, and the factors that can cause genocide are deeply embedded in the cultures of every society. Accordingly, the Auschwitz Institute has always understood that genocide prevention is one of those problems in the world that demands academic resources found only at major universities. We need great minds across many disciplines to examine the dynamic processes that cause genocide and the methods we use to break down those processes. Based on that, the Auschwitz Institute has always worked with leading academics and has always pursued academic partnerships. With that in mind, I worked with the university to establish at Binghamton an Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention. The Institute is one of the few of its kind in the United States. It is multidisciplinary, being co-chaired by Nadia Rubai from the School of Public Administration and Max Pensky from the Philosophy Department, two well-known academic leaders in this area. Most exciting is that Binghamton's Institute now offers a minor and a master's degree in this field, making it one of the few U.S. academic institutions with this kind of offering. The, the Institute also has a unique structure that provides financial support to faculty to develop new curriculum and, cor and course offerings in this area. At the same time, the Institute is designed to work with organizations like the Auschwitz Institute to provide Binghamton professors and Binghamton students with opportunities to get into the field, to see how genocide prevention really works and to learn how to assess what works and what doesn't. We can all be proud of how Binghamton has placed itself on the cutting edge in this emerging area. So now I wanna to turn to the police training program, which is an interesting example of one of our, of, of our programming and also right now is probably our fastest growing program. Over the last decade, the Auschwitz Institute has worked extensively with the US government. The Auschwitz Institute has done training for US military officers, for cadets at US service academies. We've trained many members of the FBI, the State Department, and we've also run programs for members of Congress from both parties. Based on our work with the FBI, I want to discuss an important program that is set to become a major offering for the Auschwitz Institute. And this is our US police training program. The FBI came to the Auschwitz Institute over five years ago to discuss a police training program. The focus would be on the challenges of policing marginalized and diaspora populations. This is something for which we already had devised training in Latin America and the Balkans. And the FBI asked whether we could bring that learning to bear on policing in the United States. We generally try to situate all of our programs at a site of memory 
including because memory and the acknowledgement of past atrocity crimes is a proven part of the process by which societies heal over, times and avoid, over time and avoid future atrocities. In this case, we teamed with the National Civil and Human Rights Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, for those of you who've been there, you'll remember it's right next to the big aquarium uh, and it's a beautiful facility. The museum is a powerful site containing important exhibits on the Jim Crow South, Dr. Martin Luther King, and the civil rights movement through Dr. King's death. There also is an entire wing placing the US civil rights experience into the broader context of what other countries have faced with respect to mass atrocity crimes occurring during the 20th and 21st centuries. By 2017, we had designed and implemented a pilot program that included prominent academics who worked on what became the Obama administration's report on policing in the 21st century, a report that the FBI continued to use during the Trump administration and that the Biden administration has said it will also use. Based on the early success of that program, we ran a number of in-person training cycles at the museum involving several hundred police officers. Based on that, the FBI uh, in late 2019 actually approached us about quintupling the program size, which would have involved using other museums and sites of memory around the country. Then the events of early 2020 happened and the FBI came to us with a new plan. They asked us to ramp up our police training program, first of all, to be an online capability, and they wanted it to be able to train at least several thousand policemen a year. In response, we have created two programs, a two-week course for police officers and a six-week course for police department leaders. So that would be people captain and above. The two courses cover the same ground. The difference being that the police leaders spend more time in discussion groups working through with each other how they will adapt training in their departments to the lessons learned in the program. The FBI also has asked us to design a course for police academy cadets. The course is divided into eight segments, which I'm now going to go through, and this will give you a real sense of, of our work. In unit one, we discuss social identity and deeply divided societies. The goal here is to discuss individual and group identity and the role that these respective things play in divided societies. In particular, how does, how does individual identity and group identity affect how people see themselves and how people are seen by others and how people react to authority, like policemen as they move through any society or its subset? Issues that we cover in this area include concepts of us versus them, in-group bias, how power and privilege affect how a group sees itself as compared to others. The key lessons here revolve around the idea that identity issues run through all societies and are a product of human nature and societal structures. You're not evil or bad or more likely to do something bad simply because you have these issues, they're just something you have to understand and be intentional about. Each unit comes with discussion questions and quizzes that allow the police officers to gauge their progress, including as against their classmates. As they complete steps, we give them badges. As you can imagine with police officers, that's actually very popular and they spend a lot of time comparing how many badges they've earned versus their classmates. Um, and that tends to build a lot of camaraderie in the course. In unit two, we turn to the history of policing in the United States. In particular, we show the officers using well-documented history, how large police departments generally developed in this country in response to specific perceived threats posed by particular groups. For example, in the North, large police departments were often about controlling large new immigrant populations and often ended up also being used in response to the rise of labor unionism in the late 1800s and early 1900s. In the South, police departments often developed from slave patrols whose principal job was to catch runaway or fugitive slaves. And after the Civil War, these slave patrols were often then used to enforce the Jim Crow system that arose down South in the wake of reconstruction. That is most police not develop to stop everyday crime. 
They had much more targeted purposes early on. These legacies cast a shadow over the ways we still surveil and police certain communities in the United States. In Unit 3, we look at the history of civilian review boards and police reform. The key message here for policemen is that these are not new concepts. These concepts have been around for many, many decades. And we use data and history to show that many civilian review models are not oppositional to the police. In fact, they end up benefiting policemen and policing, including by building community support for the police. The data also tends to show how transparency and accountability can over time make policing safer for both the police and the community. And this is an important message in this program. We want policemen to understand that there is hard data showing that when the community supports the police and when the police feel more comfortable policing the community, over time, policemen are safer and people in the community are safer. And that is something that they usually want to take advantage of because most police officers will tell you the thing they worry about the most is getting off each tour that they do every day safely and alive. One thing our training has shown is that within the program among police officers, the overwhelming number understand this data. And they really do want to understand what better policing means and how they can gain by it. In unit four, we do a virtual tour of the National and Civil, civil of the National Civil and Human Rights Museum in Atlanta. Uh, for those of you who haven't been, I hope one day you get to go. Uh, it's a very powerful and thoughtful museum. In particular, the exhibits allow us to focus on the role that police played in the civil rights movement and the role that security forces around the world often play in mass atrocity outbreaks. One remarkably powerful part of the museum is an area that places a person at a lunch counter sit-in during the Jim Crow era. If you get to visit the museum in person, you literally sit on a stool and put on headphones, but they've adapted it to for an online virtual experience. When you're at the lunch counter, you're exposed to a four minute dose of verbal abuse that is an actual tape of an angry mob in Greensboro, North Carolina, verbally and then physically assaulting people peacefully sitting at a lunch counter as African-Americans asking to be served. This segment is then accompanied by footage of how the mobs then attacked those sitting in while local police stood by and watched and then arrested those who had been sitting in peacefully. Like many museum visitors, it's interesting, many, many police officers have trouble lasting through all four minutes of the verbal abuse. We then ask them to discuss how the mob's actions were affected by the policemen standing by and watching. We also use this unit to present cases of police officers in Germany during the Holocaust who refused orders to kill Jews during the Holocaust. And we trace what happened to some of them, including them being thrown into camps, but the fact that after the war, they were hailed as heroes for their actions. Unit five, is about implicit bias in policing. We start by explaining what implicit bias is and how having implicit biases does not make a person a racist. Rather, these are biases that we all have. What we stress is that understanding your biases then empowers you to mitigate them, especially in the context of policing. The first thing we do is we have each police officer take a series of implicit association tests. These tests have been in use for many years and are now part of an enormous database run by five large US universities. The tests measure how quickly or easily any of us associate an image or a concept with a quality like race or sex. For example, do we associate a baby's uh, pacifier with men or women? which often strongly correlates with concepts of what do we, you know, family is more about women, careers are more about men. That's an example. In what this also tests, what the implicit bias test also will do is for example, show us how easily do we associate white faces with images of harmless objects or black faces with images of weapons. 
These tests are interesting, and I want to invite each of you to take them. You can find them online. Where Jennifer is going to send around a link to the Project Implicit homepage, uh, which is run by Harvard University, and a second link, which is a Take a Test homepage. I encourage everyone to try a few of these. Each one takes about 12, 10 to 12 minutes. And they have them relating to social attitudes, health issues, race, gender, et cetera. And after you're done taking it, and it's all anonymous and it's all encrypted, your data, your anonymous data is then added into the database. And when you're all done with each test, they show you how the database performs as a whole. And so you get to see where you fit in, in effect, based on your answers, um, where you fit in compared to everybody else. And it's very interesting. We also make sure that the officers understand that biases even exist within communities that may seem counterintuitive. For example, in the United States, black Americans are almost as likely as white Americans to be biased against black faces. That is to associate black faces with negative images like weapons. And that just shows you how implicit biases can affect even the community, even the marginalized community being policed. In unit six, we reach a part of the Auschwitz Institute's core curriculum. We discuss becoming evil how ordinary people commit atrocities. As many of you know, at the Nuremberg trials after World War II, psychiatrists were sent to interview the 23 Nazi war criminals being tried at Nuremberg by the International Tribunal. 22 of those 23 were deemed sane. Indeed, the sane 22 had no trouble correctly identifying the one true crazy in the group, who was Jules Stryker, who ultimately was hanged for his role in running the virulently anti-Semitic Nazi party newspaper. And many of you also probably know that the principal architect of the Holocaust, uh, Reinhard Heydrich, who was Hitler's man in devising the final solution, Heydrich was one of the leading classics university scholars in Europe and was also a performing concert violinist. So definitely not a crazy man by any means. In this unit, we discuss how we come to create an image of a particular group as the other and how that kind of myth building over time can cause ordinary sane people, whether they are located in Germany, Rwanda, Argentina, Chile, Russia, Myanmar, or the United States, to come to see atrocity crimes as logical responses in confronting that dangerous other that has been constructed. This is crucial to understanding that genocide is a process. It takes time. It can move through very well-developed societies with lots of educated people. It has defined warning signs and it can be delayed or prevented by breaking down the processes that turn ordinary people into killers. Finally, we address the special role that police forces historically have played in atrocity outbreaks, including by the way police, how police forces can establish cultures of cruelty that others in society then mirror. An example of this, classic example of this, is considering how ordinary white citizens in places like Alabama or Mississippi would respond when they saw the police brutally, brutally beating peaceful African-American protesters. That's a classic example where a culture of cruelty validates other people other than the police being cruel to those same people. Unit seven brings us to the idea of policing in traumatized communities. Based on community studies done over the last few decades, 30, 40 years. We know that communities experiencing trauma, whether caused by issues of poverty, race, violence, all of those things over time, fall into patterns of response that most of us would find perhaps irrational and which may complicate policing. Put simply, if based on history and repetition, the police are seen in a community as a threat 
everyday interactions that seemingly might be innocent may trigger fight or flight responses, both by the people being policed and by the police. And so very quickly, seemingly innocent transactions, innocent interactions can yield irrational results that can lead to violence. We also make clear that police experience, that, that, that the policemen policing these traumatized communities and witnessing these types of things also experience trauma themselves. And this is something that in the last 20 years has been worked on a lot, including by a very well-known Binghamton alum, Skip Rizzo, uh, who's now at the University of California in San Diego, who has done path-breaking research on how police forces who are put in situations involving traumatized societies can themselves suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. So there really is no doubt anymore that in policing traumatized communities, the police suffer too, and that needs to be addressed. What we want policemen to understand is that they and the community take all these encounters and traumas in, and that these encounters color every future encounter, unless and until we address the trauma and begin to heal the wounds created on both sides. This is the unit where it becomes clear how not addressing the role implicit bias plays in shaping police behavior can put both the community and the policemen in danger because, because threats are misunderstood, communications are misunderstood, and those misunderstandings lead to disaster in the form of violence. In the last unit, Unit 8, we present a film. The film is of interviews with police chiefs from around the United States, and these police, chief, police chiefs are all across the political spectrum. Blue states, red states, Republicans, Democrats. These chiefs all are sending the same messages, and it's very interesting. They discuss why they love being policemen and why they went into policing. They then discuss why reform is good and how they have been able to apply what they have learned about bias and community trauma to change how they police and in doing so, bring back the joy that led them into policing in the first place and the joy that comes from helping a community be better. The goal of this unit is to help the officers bond around what they have learned and to help them understand that there are people out there in the field who they can talk to, who are willing to communicate with them, and to understand that we're giving them tools to help them better understand themselves and their communities so that in the long run, they can do their jobs better and more safely. The anonymous reviews we've had of the program, which we ran in beta testing during uh, 2020, and we had about, uh, I think it was 750 police officers roll through it. The anonymous reviews have been very positive. We've had over 95% of those participating saying that the program changed how they think about themselves and their jobs and made them want more training of this kind. So that's what I'm reporting today. And the other thing I, I do want you to know is that since the Auschwitz Institute is so close to Binghamton and since I'm so close to Binghamton, one of the things we're doing is we have invited uh, both the head of the Binghamton Police Department or any of his police leaders and the head of the Binghamton University Police Force to attend uh, the police program that's being rolled out in January, February, the next uh, online version. And we're hoping that they will attend, including because we would really love to see after they've attended uh, the six week course, we would love to see them come back to the university and maybe present for the community, maybe in a lyceum setting or maybe other settings, present to the community their thoughts on what it means for Binghamton. And I think that'll be great. So with that, understanding that we're on a tight schedule, uh, we can briefly open it up for questions. Thank you for your attention. And for those who would like to learn more about the Auschwitz Institute, Jen will send you our website address. And on that website, you can see more about our publications and our reports. And that's at www.auschwitzinstitute.org. So with that, uh, Jennifer, I'm happy to open it up for questions. Um, this is Art Law. There's a couple of questions on chat. Uh, the first one from Chris Grounds. Uh, he would like to hear your thoughts on the differential police response to the BLM group uh, 
protests last year uh, and the uh, and the current one on January 6th. Right. So in terms of police response, what we witnessed both with Black Lives Matter and with with and at the Capitol actually have tremendous parallels. And it, it tells you a great deal. I mean, these are models we have seen dating back to the 19, for those who are my age or older, who, who remember race riots in the 1960s. A lot of the violence you see in these communities is not rational violence. What happened at the Capitol was not rational. What happened with Black Lives Matter was not rational uh, in terms of the rioting. And a lot of what then happens has to do with how prepared the police are for the violence. And there are models about this. What the data will tell you, and this is data literally from the 1960s on forward, is that there, if the police are not ready for outbreaks of violence, and if they really don't know that they're coming, once the violence starts, simply opening fire on people who might be looting is a difficult model. And it usually doesn't end well. Uh, just think back to places like Kent State. Once one person fires a gun, everybody else who hears the shot decides to fire too because they really don't know who's shooting at whom. Once violence breaks out, it's a cycle and it has to be controlled eventually, including by letting it spend itself. And that's been written about, that's not news. I think the key thing though is to distinguish, look at the number of Black Lives Matter protests that were not violent. Look at the ones that were peaceful and look at how the police response depending on community varied. There were some communities where peaceful protesters were shot with rubber bullets. Now that's problematic, that's troubling. And it's especially troubling when one considers what happened at the Capitol where as people started attacking the Capitol Police, they weren't fired back at with rubber bullets, even though they deserved it. And so you have to sort of look at it. And what, what that tells you is, the real lesson here is this is an issue of training. This is for police officers. And this is the way, this is the, way the FBI looks at it. This is the way the police really do look at it. This is an issue of training. Because in both cases in American society, what you want to encourage is peaceful protest. And what you want to actively prevent and discourage is violent protest. That's where the line is. That's the line between free speech and things that aren't free to do. And that's where training comes in. And it's very, very interesting. There's a book that was written about a year and a half ago about the Kerner Commission. Again, I'm older probably than a lot of people on this call. The Kerner Commission was set up by LBJ uh, after the race riots of 65 and 66. And it was chaired by the former governor of Illinois and it was very interesting. LBJ wanted the commission to find that the great society would solve the problem of the race riots. But interestingly, Kerner would not give in to the pressure from LBJ. And the Kerner Commission report reads like something that we all should read today. Because what the Kerner Commission report said was that the reason for the race riots had nothing to do with the Great Society and had nothing to do necessarily with just poverty, that the race riots were based on a series of factors and processes of which poverty was only one piece and included systemic racism built into American society that had not yet been cured in the black communities. And it included things like redlining and how real estate was owned in, in big cities and economic poverty and educational resources. And basically LBJ read the report. The report, by the way, was a bestseller on the New York Times bestseller list. LBJ read the report, saw that it didn't endorse the Great Society and then threw it on a pile and never spoke about it again. But in fact, if you look at the Obama policing, report, policing in the 21st century report, if you look at the Kerner Commission report, it is quite predictable to understand why there is rioting sometimes in certain cities when there is violence. But it's also possible to understand why other cities didn't have that experience. And that's where the teaching comes in. Do you have a title for that book or how does one get uh, access? I, to if you went on Amazon and you wrote and you put in Kerner Commission, and I think it was K-E-R-N-E-R, -E if I'm not mistaken, it may have, it, maybe it was K-O-R, K-O-E-R-N-E-R, -E but it's Kerner Commission, 
And if you just look for a book that was published 2018, 2019, you'll find it. It, it got very good reviews, both in the Wall Street Journal and in the New York Times Book Review. Uh, and it's a good read. It's a really good read. And it's, it's, it's very interesting because what it tells you is that history, if we're not careful, history does really just keep repeating itself. Um, let's see, the next question that I have on the list is, um, do you have any ideas on how we can convince the radicalized Americans, I'm using the question as words, um, that Biden won a fair election? So, you know, one of the things you've seen here, I mean, the, the whole process is very interesting to someone like me at the Auschwitz Institute, because again, it teaches you that history, if we're not careful, you know, history really does repeat itself. What you've seen here is the creation of a myth. It's very similar, and there have been some op-ed pieces on this, it's very similar to the myth that circulated in Germany in 1919 that was called the stab in the back. The German military hid from the German people the fact that the German military had been beaten fair and square on the Western Front. And instead, they took the position with the people that the left in Germany, the socialists and the communists had stabbed Germany in the back and that was why they had to surrender and sign the Treaty of Versailles. And that stab in the back myth became a central organizing myth for the Nazi party. So the first way you begin to heal society is you begin to attack the myth and you attack it with fact. And the key facts relate to court cases that were brought and that were won. And so people had their day in court and they have to respect the rule of law. And the thing that has been missing in a lot of the radicalized communications is there's no mention of the court cases that have been lost. And there's no question that in those court cases, people had an opportunity to sue about fraud and decided not to sue about fraud. And in fact, told judges they weren't even gonna use the word fraud. And yet when they got in front of microphones and cameras, they used the word fraud. The way you break these things down, that's one way. But the other way is you begin to rebuild trust in government through other means. Remember, and this is where Germany is a great example. After the stab in the back myth, the problem was that German government didn't work. The communists refused to participate because Lenin and Stalin were telling them not to. The socialists, the right wing would not speak to the socialists or enter into coalition governments with them. And the right wing decided that staying in power was more important than anything. And they decided that they could control Hitler. And they told each other that, don't worry, he's just a dummy, he's a corporal, but he's useful to us and we can control him. Well, history tells us how that sometimes works out. But it's not like history doesn't tell us how to fix our society. And the thing that we all should be very, very clear about and I as an American take a lot of solace in this, is that if we look back at American history, there have been other times when we have faced domestic terrorism. 1920s and 30s, Ku Klux Klan. Uh, 1970s, the weather underground, 210 bombings in five years. Uh, Oklahoma City and neo-Nazi and white supremacist terrorism, 9-11. What we know is that, in fact, the FBI is not too bad at figuring out what to do when, when they're let off the leash. They actually do know the difference between free speech and criminal behavior. The one good news is they are now off the leash. And I take solace in that because these groups are going to be infiltrated and they are going to be affected by the infiltration. And nobody's really their friend anymore. Even their families are ratting on them on the internet. I have a I have an addendum to that question. However, um, we seem to have people in the, high, the highest level of power perpetuating this myth, and so they will. I, I don't know if it's the people in the ground, so to speak, that I would blame at this point in time. Although you know I do in some sense, but if the president is saying this over and over again, how do you combat that? So the way you combat you combat it, no, no, so, so, so I think the way you combat it is remember, I mean, again, go back to history. I'm Jewish. I have to live with the fact that the John Birch Society, which came out of Southern California around San Diego, has existed since the late 1940s, early 1950s. It's why we didn't eat any Welch's products in my family when I was growing up. They still exist. 
they will always exist. They will always be there until society changes a lot. The question is, how do we keep them in the minority? How do we keep them from becoming the dominant voice? And I see that there are questions about police training. And yes, we have had police training on racial bias for a long time. But this highlights the issue. The issue is you can't ever stop training. And you have to keep improving training. And you have to keep deepening training. And the reason is because implicit bias is always there. It doesn't stop. It doesn't go away. And policemen are like the rest of us. They live in bubbles too. And we have to have some, we have to, in some respects, have some pity on them for that. They have to, they see, think about how many of us would never want to be police officers. Think about how you'd never want to walk a mile in their shoes. Because do you really want to spend your days seeing people at their worst? seeing people drunk and down on their luck and out of jobs and desperate and doing really bad things. And you know that that takes a toll on people. The fact is, police departments are going to get better and they need to train. The fact that the FBI wanted this training program before George Floyd happened tells you something about how this country really does work. There is a way to train to make police better because we know that not all cities in the United States have the same experiences. And one of the things we do teach in the course is that history has shown that certain structures of civilian review boards actually work. They don't end up blaming innocent policemen for bad things. They actually end up weeding out the bad apples and helping the good apples get appreciated for being good apples. And that's one of the things we're trying to teach the police officers, that there is a way to go through life being a better policeman, but one way you have to start is understanding what are your implicit biases and what are the perceptions of the community you're policing? Here's a uh, question. I'm kind of scanning through the questions. Here's something that seems to be a little bit different. Um, do you have an opinion on censorship being conducted by the big tech companies concerning you and the resulting balkanization of social media. Yeah, so it's interesting. I'm, I, this obviously doesn't have to do with police training, but the Auschwitz Institute actually has been writing some papers for some of the big tech companies and saying things that they don't like to hear. I'm one of those people who actually doesn't believe that social media is a matter of free speech because I think social media is very different from true free speech. It used to be when crazy Jacques in front of the Bastille stood up and yelled death to the king. He wasn't really anonymous. People in the crowd knew who he was. He was crazy Jacques who always gets up and shouts death to the king. He felt anonymous because of the crowd, but he wasn't really anonymous. The internet creates a true anonymity that takes away any, any form of self-regulation and I think leads to a lot of bad habits. My view also, however, is that internet companies should not own your data. You should own your data. So my view, frankly, is that we should end internet company immunity for the content of their websites. We should take away their Section 230 of the Communications Act uh, protection, because that was put there to help a fledgling industry get off the ground. They're no longer a fledgling industry. But with that removal should come the idea that going forward, they don't own your data. You own your data and you have to give them very specific instance by instance access to data. And by the way, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal two weekends ago about a guy who's designing software just to allow that. If we were to move toward that model, my view is that internet companies like Facebook and Apple and Google would actually become like trading platforms. Their job is to provide you with a safe and secure platform where you, where you will in effect trade information, not to give you a place to say anything you want completely uncensored because you feel truly anonymous. So that's sort of where I come out on the internet. And I think the most pernicious evil of these companies are the algorithms they use to put in front of your eyes only things within your bubble. That is very destructive. It's a bad thing and they shouldn't be allowed to run those kind of algorithms. That's not what they're about. You should be about picking your own bubble. It should be about your choice, not a machine-driven choice. Jen, do you want, we, uh, do you want Yeah, to it's time not to forget the music. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I'm being told. I'm seeing the chat. Don't forget the music. Yes, I believe Eileen um, Lyceum has a couple remarks and we'll introduce our musicians for today. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. Um, I am the president of the Lyceum and um, people who are not aware of what the Lyceum is, it's, um, it's a lifelong learning institute that has been associated with Binghamton University for 33 years. You may not have heard about it if, when you were students, but it was there. <laughs> so um, what we do is we teach all kinds, we have all kinds of class offerings and programs. We've been forced to go online this year. So anyone can see any of our classes from anywhere in the world. We have just for an example, this winter session, this is our, our kickoff for our 2021 um, winter and spring sessions. And we have, for example, Tuscan Epicure Cooking brought to you um, with an interactive demonstration from Italy itself. So that's a, an unusual class. We have an in-depth study of a work from the Rockwell Museum in Corning. We have um, a class on introduction to autonomous intelligence robots by some professors at Binghamton. We have a notable fiction where this semester we're going to be talking about Sapiens, um, A Brief History of Humankind, and we have more classes in the spring. We also have an original play brought to us from New York City Playwright, and it's going to be based on um, different views of the, of the times we're going through. It's called When These Things, When This Thing Is Over. So um, this is just a sampling of some of the classes that we offer but we offer quite a range of probably over 100 classes a year that um, alumni are um, able to take and have actually 50% off their membership fees um, from the Alumni Association is chipping in. So we have a partnership now with the Alumni um, Engagement um, Association. So um, that was to tell you about Lyceum and I hope that maybe you'll look up our catalog and maybe take some classes. You can just go to Binghamton University Lyceum and you can read all about us. Um, but now we have, um, I wanna introduce our musicians and these are both also Lyceum members and from our local community. It's uh, Shepard and you and it's composed of Julian Shepard on the cello, Lee Shepard on the piano and they play elegant and exuberant music from the English country dance repertoire. Julian is a biology professor at Binghamton University and an expert in birds, bugs, flora, and fauna. And he also often teaches classes for us. Lee is a retired journalist and music publicist. They play for fundraisers, fairs, festivals, churches, coffee houses, dances, and weddings. And uh, if you're not familiar with English dance, if you've ever seen a Jane Austen movie, you've probably heard the genre. Musicians work from a melody line and improvise the rest. So this music will span 600 years from medieval times to tunes that were actually written next, last week. So anyway, I will now introduce um, our, our musicians for the rest of the program. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. At this point, we're going to turn it back over to Eileen for just a few closing remarks. <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you, Julian and Lee, for some wonderful music. And thank you, Owen, so much for an interesting and educational talk. We would, uh, we would be delighted to have you anytime, believe you me. And uh, I also want to thank um, the Alumni Engagement Office. I want to thank Jen and Kimberly Farber for setting this up and partnering with us. And uh, to remind everyone that our classes begin on Monday. And very soon, we're going to be having the, winter ca the spring catalog out as well including some special May classes that we're working on to try to boost some of our lost revenue for this year. So thank everyone for coming. Thank you all. And hopefully next year we can have this in person with refreshments and, uh, <laughs> and the way we normally do. All right, that's all I have to say. So thank you very much. <laughs>